All right, guys. Thanks for joining me, man. So a couple of things that we're going to dig into. At least it's what we have planned. We'll see if it (laughs) goes here. But um, Sean, you brought up a couple months ago, like, uh, hey, it's actually not a good idea to pay off your mortgage early. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have some pretty interesting reasons why. And I I do want to go through that. And then I do want to talk through the SBB stuff and kind of what happened. And then uh, we'll go over really what's actually happening and what people need to know. Because sure. people are asking you tons of questions about Absolutely. FDIC, everything like that. So I think let's dig into that. But sure. first, the mortgage thing. Dude, yeah. I've been I've been told forever. Uh, I know I know my parents did it. I know sure. a lot of people that do it that it's like, hey, pay off your mortgage as soon as you can. Right. Um you got some differing opinions on that. So <laughs> let, where where do we start with that? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, it's nice to be back. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks uh, for coming back, man. Yeah. We didn't scare you off the first th- time. Thanks for having me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Last time I, I I thought I did really well here, and and then but I looked at the video and it was like I had just gotten out of that massive rain pour, and I'm like on camera I look like a wet dog, bro. <laughs> it's like, it's I like, thought you looked good. Uh, my hair was all wet and awful, so I was like, it's "All like right." It's like a movie. It's like a movie moment. Yeah, right. Yeah, that like, conversation was good enough. I didn't. Yeah, yeah, didn't right? even realize that yeah. your hair was like that. So yeah, welcome was, back, man. Yeah. You're looking sharp. I look a lot this, better today. You got the suit on. Yeah, looking spiffy. Looking a little better. Sure. Yeah. So We're going, no rain. Yeah. Yeah. No, no rain. No rain. Um, so yeah, I guess we we can jump right into it. So I I think first of all, um, I come from the perspective of I was trained on a platform called the Circle of Wealth and. So if you look at kind of financial services in general, right, you have kind of one of two ways that you can help a client. The first is you can sell them better products that, ha- that pay potentially higher rates of return that often require more risk, right? So that's kind of the accumulation story in, in the financial services. Or you can help people find money that they're losing unknowingly or, unknowingly or unnecessarily, right? And so that's a, a totally different approach on how you help people. Okay. Um, so... We were trained around five major ways or uh, what we call unnecessary wealth transfers, which was number one was the mortgage, two were taxes, three was how you're funding your qualified plans, your 401ks, IRAs, SEPs, that kind of stuff. Uh, Then your kid's education, right? And then finally, what we call major capital purchases. So a major capital purchase is anything that you can't pay for in full with monthly cash flow, right? Like a car or a wedding. Or whatever, right? And most okay. of the time in America, that's financed, right? Put on put on credit cards, right? So, so the mortgage is always the most interesting one of those five because it's usually the most emotional conversation that we have with clients. Because to your point, you know, America has been you know conditioned to pay off their property as as fast as possible, right? Well, so plus, it's it's like the biggest purchase sure. that most people make. Absolutely, more money usually goes through through the mortgage than any other. Uh, thing that they they purchase, right? And so I think making sure that you get that uh, purchasing decision correctly done uh, and and minimizing that unnecessary loss is a big deal, all right? Especially the houses down here in in Southwest Florida, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think you know we'll we'll start with I guess one basic financial premise, right? That everyone needs to understand is I like to say you finance everything you buy, right? And when I say that, what is what what comes up for you there? My thought, my initial thought would be that that's not a good idea in some ways, or I at least have like a a negative perception of it because it makes me think like you're buying things that you can't afford. Okay. But maybe that's, I think about that on maybe smaller purchases, like many smaller, like thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollar purchases. You now have all these like, uh, layaway kind of like pay as you go plans, but pay an interest on it. Okay. I don't know. To me, I don't, tr- maybe it's, I don't trust myself enough to know that, Hey, that money's n- like, since it's not gone, I view it as like, it's still mine, but I don't know. I can't plan it as good. You probably I, mean it under the form of an umbrella, right? You finance I, anything that you buy. Either you're financing my it or somebody works, else's. No, my no, brain no. works different you, than you, most people. You <laughs> overthought that one, bro. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's very simple, right? You either pay cash for something, right? Okay. Or you let someone else use yeah. their money, right? So in other words, when you pay cash, most people don't think that this is financing. But when you do pay cash for something, you give up the ability to earn interest on that money. 
right? Okay. So if you were going to go pay for a car, a $20,000 car, you could walk in there. And if you asked 100 people, if you could pay cash for that car at $20,000, would you, right? And 95 plus percent would say absolutely, right? Because it comes from the perspective of that when you pay cash for something, you no longer have to uh, pay interest on that money, correct? Yeah. Okay. But, but that you, money's gone. That, exactly. Right, so you're not earning interest so you're, either. Exactly. So you're, so you're not earning interest on anything, anything okay. either, right? So we like to say that paying cash is self-financing from your future lifestyle. Self-financing from your future lifestyle. Paying cash is self-financing from your future lifestyle, meaning that. Let me give you an example. So I, so I, I crunched a number here. Um, if, if let's just assume that somebody could pay cash for a house here, and I just moved a five hundred thousand dollar house, right? Okay. So if you paid cash for a five hundred thousand dollar house, um, and you and you let that grow, that money grow, right? Let, so let me let me say it back. If you didn't pay cash for the for the property, right? And let's say you went and financed it, right? And you took that five hundred thousand and you put it into an account. And you just let that account, that money grow for 30 years, right? That $500,000 at 5% interest would grow to over 2 million bucks, right? Mm -hmm. So if you paid cash for that house, what you lost over that 30 year time frame was the $2 million at the end of 30 years. Because from that perspective, it could be repurposed elsewhere and it could be working for you making money. Exactly. So this is what okay. we call lost opportunity cost in finance, right? And lost opportunity cost says every time that you pay cash, you could have actually gone and saved the money and put it to work in another place, right? Okay. So you know, I grew up in Oklahoma, right? $500,000 house in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's a beast, you know? That's, yeah, that's a, sure. That's a, that's a nice mini mansion, right? Yeah, there. that's right. It's like a $2 million house. <laughs> yeah, 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 probably, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I tell people in Oklahoma who pay cash, I said, you know, do you understand what you're giving up on that money? And most people don't understand what they're, what they're losing, right? So in other words, if you were to pay a proper, pay cash for that $500,000 property, and in 30 years, you couldn't sell that property for $2 million plus, that's the difference that you lost. So let's say you could sell it in, for 1.5 million in 30 years. Okay. You lost... $500,000 on that decision unnecessarily because you didn't finance with a bank and let that money grow, right? So it all, it all, it's all about the spread, right? I mean, in, in, in a perfect world, let's say the mortgage was 4%, right? And you could go earn 5%, right? Again, remember we were talking about the privatized banking. That's not a 1% return. It's a 1% yield or 1% spread. Um, so every, you know, coming back to the whole thing, what do you finance everything you buy? You got to understand that your cash has a cost when you pay when you pay cash for it, right? And um, in a perfect world, what I would do is I wouldn't go pay cash for a property. I would go to a bank and have them finance it for thirty years, right? And put the minimum amount down, and then I would go use that money at, that I wasn't going to pay cash for the house in another thing, right? And so you have the appreciation in the house, right? Because uh, real estate's an interesting asset, right? It, houses appreciate or depreciate regardless of how much equity is in the home, yep. right? Because the market is driving um, the rate or the, the increase or decrease in the market, right? Not how much equity you have, right? Sure. So in a perfect world, if you're if you're smart, you would have the, the, the real estate mortgage and you would have the growth outside and you would get both. <clears throat> Got it. So where that comes in is then you would need to be, you would need to be like, aware enough, perceptive enough to know where to put that money in a smart way outside of that. Because one of the reasons why I, so like I, like we we're talking about before, like I, I refinance like from a 30 to a 15 year, uh, for the reason of wanting to, um, pay off the home faster, pay it off faster. Exactly. And because all right, so how does this work? Because I'm under the impression that with amortization and interest building over that time, like a 30-year loan for, I don't know, 300000 you end up spending like, um, like close to 800000 in that time. 
Like, it's actually worse than that. It's or closer to like a million or something like well, that. Well, what you're saying is is what what actually you're paying with the house with interest, right? With interest, with interest over interest, that time, right? Yeah. But you also have to make another calculation with what that you lost, you paid that interest, or that interest could have gone and earned money. So there's opportunity cost on the interest as well, mm -hmm. right? So the truth in lending laws that have been passed to show what you're actually paying at interest, they don't tell you the whole truth about that actual number. A lot of people don't know that. So. Uh, what do you mean? Okay. So, okay. So let's say you have, what, that would you say? $300,000 house and you're going to pay most of the times. It's usually, isn't it about double the house, right? Usually it depends. It depends on what the amortization schedule looks like. You right. have to understand both sides of the amortization table. Right. Right. Cause that interest is front loaded most of the time, right? right? All the time it's front loaded. And then you understand that as you get closer to paying off the loan, you're paying down on your principal. Correct. Right. So it's, there's an amortization schedule for any loan that you do if it's and out. So of course. Okay. Yeah. So when you're paying interest on that property, right, you could have taken that extra interest plus principal and put that money to work. So you have an opportunity cost on the principal and you have opportunity cost on the interest. Because right? basically you're you're paying both the principal and the interest. That money is gone. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So that's where the opportunity cost is, is, on, okay. is on that, right? So the reason why I the reason why I was looking to switch it is because I'm under the impression, maybe you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm under the impression that if you were to take a let's say we moved it to a 15 year, um, we did get a better interest rate. This is when they went even lower. Yeah. So the timing kind of worked. I think our interest rate almost got cut in half, which was nice. Um, but I was under the impression if you pay an extra thousand bucks a month or something like that, that in the longer term, because you're paying that thousand dollars to principal, that you would be paying the house down faster. You will. You, you so you, okay. You essentially on what what's happening on the actual note itself is you are paying down the loan faster. Okay. Are do you end up spending less in that time, or do you end up spending the same amount? So this is this is the 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 major 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 question. You just hit it right on the head. Yeah. So, so in a perfect world, meaning that if if you have an interest rate, and I I know this doesn't happen in the real world, but I'm just going to make the analogy so so people can track. Let's assume that um, the three hundred thousand dollar payment was give give me a round number from thirty year to fifteen. Like how how much did your payment go up? Four hundred bucks a month. Okay. All right. So if you if a person got um, a thirty year mortgage, right, and they they had a four hundred dollar less of a payment, okay, they could have taken that savings, right, and they could have gone and invested it, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's assume they can make five percent on that money, right. So they they start putting four hundred dollars away in an account month one of three hundred and sixty, right. Yep. And the same person in the 15 year, he's paying $400 extra a month, right? And he's going to pay off that house in 15 years, right? Then at the end of 15 years, that person could have taken the entire mortgage that they were that they were used to paying, right? And could be started to save it, right? So one person has been paying $400 a month for three, 30 months into an account, and another person has been paying the, the difference for 15 years, right? If the interest rate or the uh, the interest rate is still the same, those people are in the exact same financial position. Hmm. That's a surprise for most people. So, yeah, I'll why, need to, why, I need why, to, why do okay. banks why do banks give you a lower rate on 15 years? Because that's the inducement to try and pay off the money, right? If if it if it wasn't lower, nobody would take the 15 year, right? right? I would yeah, I wouldn't take a. I don't think I. Would, yeah, I wouldn't take a fifteen year if it was the same same interest or higher. Right, of course. Then you'd be paying more money towards it anyway. Right. Okay. So, all right, I'll need to wrap my head around this one. But it's also behavioral too, right? So, for a lot of it is, everyone thinks holistically. And again, for me, as somebody who's been in banking for a long time, a lot of it's behavioral and comfort, right? So what do you mean? I there's a certain level of comfort to knowing that the largest financial vertical that you financed into, which is a mortgage or a home is paid off. And that's totally okay. Yeah. I've seen that all the time. 
But I've also witnessed the other side of the token where some people are very comfortable leveraging their debt, right? Okay. And leveraging their liquidity to take some of that opportunity cost and benefit from it, right? And not have the lost opportunity cost. There is no right or wrong answer, in my eyes anyway, right? When I look at it, if somebody prefers to have the comfort of knowing that their home is paid off and now they've just added to their cash flow, then some people prefer to do that. But the other side of the token is behaviorally, let's say you, Chris, you paid off your home tomorrow, right? How much of a, roughly, you don't have to give me an exact amount because that's a probing question, but <laughs> how much monthly cash flow does that free up for you, roughly? Give me a round number. I mean, like at least 2,500 bucks, we'll okay. say. $2,500. Yeah. Do you think the average person who just had $2,500 freed up to their monthly cash flow is going to take that full 2500 and save strategically it. save it month over month. Would no. you? No. No. Nobody would. Zero, zero would. I probably yeah. wouldn't either, right? You start seeing some things that are attractive. I could get a nicer car. Yeah. It's the lifestyle. I can, Always I can throw on a lifestyle. watch. So, so part, of it, part of it will go to lifestyle. You hope that all of it doesn't, right? right? And sometimes it does. Sometimes people are very frugal and they'll take that entire amount. And they have the wherewithal to say, I'm going to take this exact amount and I am going to benefit from that lost opportunity cost over the first 15 years. And for the next 15 years, I'm going to take full benefit of it. What you have to recognize over the entirety of that process is how much more benefit are you going to get long-term versus short-term between both options, right? Okay. So for, for me, um, there are loans that I have paid off earlier than usual. When I think about it going forward, was it the right financial decision for me? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Depends on how the market changes too, right? Mm -hmm. How the economy changes. Right now, we happen to be in a somewhat innocuous sort of position with the market and with the economy where we don't really know exactly what the future holds. But there's if, if history proves itself, there are going to be some opportunities coming up relatively shortly mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe a little bit further out, but opportunities will present themselves. Maybe not to how some of the opportunities presented themselves in the past with major economic shifts, mm -hmm. but for someone who does not have the liquidity to take advantage of those opportunities, then you start to look back. Like there's a lot of people in 2008 that look back and they were like, man, I wish I had some extra cash to sell yeah. on because I would have been able to take advantage of some major opportunities, right? right? So there's a balance there. There's a there's a balance. And there is no, I I can't per se that there's a direct right or wrong answer because I've done both and I've seen benefits and fallouts from both. Sure. But right. what I can say is that there are certainly ways to win in both environments. And, and a lot yeah. of what Sean is talking about is how to sort of position yourself to win in both of those environments. That's how I look at it from a long-term and short-term banking perspective. I think, I think there's, that was really well said, yeah. um, Sergio. I think um, behavior is a huge thing that just because the math, what he's saying is just because the math is more efficient on one way to pay off a house, that doesn't mean in reality that people are going to do the most efficient thing, right? Sure. There's a lot more ways to pay off a house than just pay it in a mortgage, right? Like if I have $300,000 in another account, and I have a mortgage, in my mind, my house is paid off. Like I could write a check to pay off that house today, right? Is it in my financial best interest to do so? In my world, no, right? Because now in some other people's worlds who don't have, don't own businesses and don't have yeah. investment opportunities, et cetera, their cost of capital is if they got a seven and a half percent mortgage, like you should be paying that mortgage down, right? Because that's the best opportunity you have to, to make seven and a half percent, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in my world, seven and a half percent is that's that's not that's not where I'm going to put my capital, right? So it's ultimately about I think how are you paying off the mortgage, and and you can have 15 years, you can have 30, but in my opinion, when you put money into a, an asset that you don't typically own, right? I mean. Yes, the bank owns that 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 asset, right? And if you're going to put extra money into that, then that means you have to go requalify for it if you need that capital, right? So mm -hmm. in, in my world, why do I not pay off properties as fast as possible? Because I want access and control of my dollar, period. That's that's where, why I do it. Um, but, okay. you know, so, th it, so there's give and take. You're a business owner, right? Maybe that 
extra $400 could be put to work in your company a little bit better than to the mortgage, right? And that's what you were. Now we just had a full revolution of the you finance you everything you buy because that $400 is now not going into your company, right? Yeah. And and that, that's kind of what the give and take that he's 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 hit on perfectly sure. is you've got to think of <clears throat> all of the the potential um, opportunities or expenses that your capital has. Well, it's, and, it, and for the people for the people that recently got a mortgage, right? If you're looking at people that got a mortgage 2018, 2019, 2020 right. when COVID happened, right? Like you, you said that you refinanced, right, Chris, into a 15-year. Yeah. You probably got a phenomenal rate. Yeah. I'm assuming. So it's like, like 3% or Yeah, something. exactly, there right? The same thing with myself. I actually refinanced from higher threes into the twos yeah. on a 30-year, right? And those were available options right. during that time. For the, the people that got in there with those loans, right, you have, you have a hyper-efficient loan what you're paying on that loan yeah. versus the interest that you're giving up, that is a very efficient loan. It makes it makes very little sense. To me, if I'm a business owner or I'm someone who's looking for outside investment opportunities to go in there and say, I'm going to take my liquid assets and pay down this efficient loan exactly. as quickly as possible, right? You also have to look at the value of the dollar long-term, right? Inflation has gone up a lot. Your $2,000 payment today, Chris, is not going to be worth the same in five to 10 years. Okay. Because as the dollar, because that dollar as inflation rises, and that's not to say that inflation is going to continue to rise at the pace that it's risen over the past year or so, at least we, we hope not, right? Yeah. We see, as bankers, we see lights at the end of the tunnel. But ultimately, that mortgage payment, you're paying that same fixed amount, but the dollar is devalued. So you're actually paying less in a sense, even though the dollar amount's the same, because you're not, in the beginning, you're paying with your most valuable dollar. Right. Okay. So you have to think about where you're putting that most valuable dollar. Are you giving that to someone else to use or are you keeping those valuable dollars for yourself and benefiting from them with other investment opportunities or other vehicles that can continue to improve your cash flow month over month? So it really just depends. Right. People okay. look at it differently. So it's it's about being really strategic, but also mitigating risk. Correct. That's, that's to me as a banker. I always look at both. You have to be very strategic but you also want to mitigate risk. And that's those are the two main topics that I talk to my clients about every single day. Yeah. So a couple other things I'd add is, is real world factors, right? We're talking about real world stuff that happens. You know, disability from a sickness or an accident is the number one reason that people lose their home in the United States, right? And so, um, you know, access to capital is is a is a huge thing if obviously if you become disabled right and if you don't have disability insurance right that's why we I own the life insurance and disability brokerage and so we sell a lot of disability insurance for to business owners to a cover their income but also b cover their their expenses for their company but if they don't have that right most of the time what's the first place they're going to try and pull from they, they try to go their, the bank. their, their, their equity right yeah. in their in their in like home equity line of credit HELOC right so. So, you know, depending on if they can show the bank income or not is, is going to be the number one factor. And if they can access that, that uh, home equity line of credit, right? So would you rather have the money sitting in a safe liquid account if you're disabled or become sick or sitting in the mortgage? Yeah. Right. Or well, let's talk about a hurricane too, right? So as, as everybody yeah. knows down here, right, we just went through one of those, um, I guess it's coming up on what seven eight months now. Yeah, it's about seven eight months it happened September twenty eighth. So crazy it's close there. Yeah, yeah, seven eight months. Seven seven. It'll be seven months next week. There you go. Wow. So you know, um, again, when if you if you have a, a major catastrophe, right? And would you rather have access to the capital or paid off house, right? Um, so these are the kind of real world things that you need to kind of potentially work through, and and it, it usually comes from the perception that the shorter the loan the shorter the cost, right? Sure. 15 years, I'm not going to pay as much interest as a 30 year, right? But again, it's about opportunity cost too, because every time you could have paid, if you're doing the same thing, if the if the behavior matches up, <coughs> there isn't any difference in, in a 15 year and a 30 year. Now, I, I don't. I haven't looked at bank rates in the last couple of weeks or something. So, but I but I don't. I don't know what the. Do you know what the major like difference in spread that a fifteen year is between a thirty? Like, is it? Like I haven't looked recently bips, either. Or? But it could. It's probably close to that. Fifteen year. 
is probably in the in the five somewhere, right. and, a, and a thirty year still in the sixes. But they've come down a little bit since right. where they were. Right. They were they were in the sevens and eights at one point. So. Right. So if if so, a hundred bips, right? To to me, how I look at it is, I would rather control the money for the difference in that in that cost of that capital. Sure. Well, and it's so it comes down to a couple of factors. It seems like is you, you have to have one. You need to know that this is an option, even. And then how you look at your money and lifestyle, right? Sure. So there's like two things. So it's if you were – before I learned about any of this, I didn't even know that this was an option. So in my mind, it was like I'm not thinking about opportunity cost or if I were to take that money and put it elsewhere and have it working. My thought is, okay, if I can pay this off – and I own the house, all that I have is uh, tax payment and HOA. So if right. something happens for whatever reason, like I already have my house and I just have to come up with money for my taxes and my HOA. Right. Sure. So that's, but, that's where like the security side of my thing comes into play. But one thing I didn't real world factor I didn't consider was like, hey, once I pay that off, that $2,500, like, like you said, it never suddenly goes, okay, well, now we're going to deploy this to a strategic uh, thing. It's, it's like, a Porsche. Correct. finally, <laughs> it's I a can, Porsche. yeah. It's a Porsche or a watch or, <laughs> yeah. or a mix of right. both, right? right. And right. and some of it may go into savings. Some of sure. it may go into yeah. a long-term vehicle where you're looking at, you know, generating financial wealth for you and your future and future generations, which intellectually that's probably the best decision that you can make is looking at long term if you want to build this sort of generational wealth. It, the 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 thing that comes to fruition though is that you know, we could almost say 100% of the time not everyone has the wherewithal. It's the self discipline to, and the discipline. They yeah. don't have the discipline to take the entire sum of money that they are now have saved. They've just hit a massive milestone, right? They no. own a home free and clear. That's, right. that's, that's, a, that's, that's right. the biggest accomplishment. That's, that's the American dream, right? Having a home is the American dream. So when you look at taking that and then using it to its full capability, very rarely happens, if ever. So I got two two more points, and then let's let's uh, let's transition to SVB. Yeah, let's talk yeah. there. Um, a couple things. I, I one other thing I would add for sure is is you know when. There, there is a, a kind of a fallacy about the the more equity you have in the home, the more safe you are, right? Okay. I mean, so, you know, he'll back me up here. Like, you are in, the bank is in the absolute best possible position before the last single month that you put to pay off that house, right? Okay, how so? Well, because they own the property. They can, okay. if you can't, if you can't continue to make payments, you you don't have a guaranteed line of credit. You have to qualify for that credit, right? Okay. So, so, you know, that, that's a, that's a mis a fallacy that, that, oh, the more equity I have, the more banks are willing to work with me. And that's, that's actually the total opposite, right? They have more leverage over you than, than they've ever had because now they until can Until you get to uh, that point. Until you get to that that's, point. That's, and my, my my mm -hmm. mind has never been, I've never thought like, oh, I'm more stable the lower I get. My thought is like, once I get there, that's where the stability is. Right, right. So, but I, I do see what you're saying because people would, people would think like percentage wise, like, oh, I'm 90% to the finish line. Right. Okay, that, that, understood. That last 10% is pretty risky if you can't make the payment. That, eh, fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. Second, last thing I'll say is, is. Uh, I, it just really rubs me the wrong way when people say that they're buying a home to live in as an investment, okay? So um, maybe down here, if you time the market right, okay, cool. Sure. But if you, for most people, if you're going to raise a family in this home and this is your home, right, and you're thinking that you're just going to all of a sudden buy this property and it's going to go up forever and you're going to sell it, Normally, the average family doesn't take into account all of the other expenses that nobody talks about. So property taxes, homeowners insurance, um, uh, more uh, tax, um, everything, maintenance, um, you know, the pool yeah. goes out. It's a 10 grand, right? Yeah. So like when you actually, you know, do the math and we, we do the math with the client, right? What did, when did you buy it? How many years in there? What's the average? expenses, maintenance, insurance, et cetera. 
when you actually crunch that numbers, like 95% of people are in a negative. They're in the negative, right? Even with all the, all the upside, right? So, or they're in the ones or in the twos or whatever, right? So your home is a lifestyle expense, right? Yeah, it's, it, I view it as, yes, it's an, it's an investment that you ultimately turn into an asset, but it doesn't, it, that to me, doesn't really turn into that until like you've kind of paid it off or get built equity and then you sell it. In that meantime, it's still expensive to be there. Like you still have to pay for all this right. stuff. Okay. I, I, I would respectfully disagree. I, I think that your house is, it's a lifestyle choice, right? It's, it, you know, sleeping underneath, uh, sleeping outside is not very fun. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. right? Sleep, we all want to sleep inside, right? Sure. And so that, that habit that we have of wanting to sleep inside, some people pay a thousand bucks a month for that. Some people pay a hundred thousand bucks a month for that. Right. So, but ultimately I think, I think most investors or most families who think that going and buying in a house that they live in is this great investment. My, my kind of take on it is make sure you do the math. Right. And, sure. and it's not just, Oh, you bought it for 300 and you sold it for five fifty. We made $250,000 off that investment. That's not telling the whole truth. Sure. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you that it's not like, it's not cut and dry. It's just more like, Hey, when it's time to move on and sell right. this thing, right. now I have this basically chunk of cash or right. this equity that I can transfer to something else. Whereas if I was renting or doing anything like that, I'm not really like building towards anything. Right. So no, I have I, something I think that's, at the, I think that's accurate. And the I end think, of the rainbow. And obviously, <laughs> obviously we're talking about what you're living in personally, right? When yeah. other people are living it, then that's now we're in the investment world, right? Yep. But anyway. Yeah, gotcha, so, gotcha. Take All that right. for what it's worth. Let's, uh, let's transfer over to SVB. I know we were going to talk about this when it was uh, right going on. And then I got sick, so we pushed this about a month. So- all right, where do we start with SVB? What's what what's what's the rundown of what happened? Well, I think the response level? to the initial, you know, fear has been very well taken by people for the most part, right? I mean, I think ultimately when something somewhat catastrophic happens in the economy or raises major red flags or concerns, the Ideally, what ends up happening in the world that we live in today is that all this attention's brought to it, and then these fans are flamed, and then yeah. you know they every, yourselves, everybody no tries way. to make yeah, <laughs> yeah for yourselves, no, <laughs> no way. way right. So that ultimately <laughs> becomes the major concern, and then the next question of everybody is, is my bank safe? Right. You know, that's that's the first thing that comes to your mind, and when something like that happens at an institution outside of some of the largest institutions in the world that are national global institutions. The concern is, do I need to take my money and move it somewhere else where it's at a bank that, you know, quote unquote, everybody talks about too big to fail, right? Sure. What people don't recognize is that Signature Bank was a pretty large bank, you know, based on their deposit base, they were a pretty large institution. So they, a lot of people would reference it and say, oh, that was a smaller bank that failed, but Silicon Valley Bank by no means was a smaller bank. And there was a lot of there was a lot of strategic errors that were made along the way that most banks don't follow, right? Okay. It's not the norm. It was outside the norm of what happens. And I think that as more messaging came out and there was more clarity brought to the situation, people started to recognize that some of those bank failures were one-offs, you know, massive errors made by the institution that ultimately led to the downfalls and failures of that particular institution versus this issue that's now in a silo. Systemic risk. Yes. Right? People, I think, were scared that it was a systemic risk again, yeah. right? Because sure. the 2000, I would just, I actually just watched a couple of days ago the Too Big to Fail on HBO that yeah. they have that, that movie, right? Where it's centered around Hank Paulson, who was the Treasury Secretary, right? Ex Goldman guy. And just the nature of those conversations where it starts to, escalate and then one one massive investment bank is failing which in there so they've got so much of a piece of another one that it's starting to spill over right and it started and, and like i think that that was kind of for a day or two there i'm i'm gonna be totally honest i was like are we in systemic risk again yeah like, sean like, sean and i talked <laughs> <laughs> he was like what's going on <laughs> i'm like yeah is, we're in systemic risk like because because the thing about most people don't understand is that you can't get out of systemic risk, right? Like if, you're, if your money's in 
the market, right? And something happens systemically to the whole system. It doesn't matter where you have your money. You're, yeah. you're, you're going to lose money, right? And it might be minus 30 or it might be minus 20, but I mean, it's not plus four, right? That's why I love whole life insurance. Like yeah. five, five every day, every year, right? <laughs> like all day, every day, 5% tax-free, right? No risk. So, um, so it's important to have both, but I, I think, you know, systemic risk is, is the, the major thing that I think a lot of people had a little PTSD, maybe, you know, which Some was concerns. Is, yeah, concerns, um, around the nature of what that is. Well, what, so, so what were the questions that you were getting? Cause you said that <clears throat> people came to you with like a handful cool. of questions. Our, that, com our community slash smaller bank safe, right? Mm, is okay. my money safe due to FDIC? You know, I have this much at the bank. What does that mean? right? Um, do I need to move my money around and strategically put my money at different institutions so that everything is protected or insured, right? So there was a lot of questions as to, you know, how is your bank capitalized, right? Because we are a community bank that takes a lot, that puts a lot of attention and detail into servicing clients that are within our tight-knit communities, mm -hmm. right? As most banks do. So if you look at strategically and optically how community banks take care of their clients and what type of client base they have, they've never been safer than before, right? Because you look at SVB and it's the same as anything else when you look at it from a risk perspective, right? If like our CEO put it a great way, he said, if you were talking to me and I was your financial advisor and you had hundred thousand dollars, Chris. And I said, Hey, listen, I'm going to take your hundred thousand dollars and I want to put all of it in this one stock. Mm -hmm. Would you do it? No, no. Right. Nobody would. Cause you have to diversify, right? You, anybody who, who does investments know that they have to have a diversified portfolio because that's what hedges their risk and maximizes po their potential in the future. It's SVB, a large contingent of their client base was all in the tech industry. Okay. Okay. Most of their deposits were uninsured. That's not the norm, okay? Whereas you look at SVB, I believe 90% or more of their deposits were uninsured. So what, is, what does that mean? What does that for, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for gonna... the normal, for, for per se, I'm going to keep this as basic as possible. If for you're me, a business please. account, <laughs> Yeah, if you're a business account, you're a business account, you have $250,000 in that account. Those $250,000 per the FDIC are insured. Okay. What is Above and over that, there's a potential there that that may have to be looked at during an event just like what happened at SVB Correct. where everyone was scrambling to, can I walk into the bank tomorrow and take out a cashier's check or send a wire for everything? No, you can't, right? Until the storm has calmed down right. and they can take a look at what the next steps are for that potential bank, right? So that's what ends up happening. Most of those businesses, those major tech firms in SVB, because they had built strong relationships with that type of client base through their products and services, were uninsured deposits. Whereas you look at even some of the larger banks, they hedge in the 50% range of uninsured deposits. A community bank, even less than that, right? Because a large majority of the clients that you have are not falling out of that insured umbrella. Of so when the you FDIC. say when you say uninsured deposit, you mean any like 90% of their accounts had over the $250,000. Not 90% of their accounts per se, but right? 90 but 90% of the deposits, 90% of the dollars okay. were uninsured cuz you could have one business who has, you know, 200 40, 40 400 million, 400 million dollars in the account. Right. There were some that were like that, right? Yeah. They have 400 million dollars liquid. That would make up a large percentage of the deposits within that institution, but it wouldn't necessarily mean that a majority of their depositors were uninsured. It would just mean a majority of their <laughs> deposits as okay. a whole really top were heavy. uninsured. Very t exactly, very, very top, top heavy, heavy, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then it's what does the bank do with those deposits? How are they capitalized? So the way in which SVB was structured was not the norm for a bank as well, right? A, a large contingent of SBB's clients were not coming in to get loans because they were highly liquid clients mm -hmm. and they had the backing of a lot of, you know, venture capital, okay. things like that, that would support those tech firms. So there was not a need for loans. A lot of banks make their profits within their portfolio on loans, right? Either the spread within the interest rate in a loan 
or on selling a loan to the secondary market and having a markup on that, right? So that's how a bank strategically and safely diversifies their portfolio. Some of it are investments that they make, another portion of it loans, and another portion of it other vehicles, right? So SVB was very top heavy on taking their deposits because they had such a large influx of deposits. And then they went ahead and they bought treasury notes and treasury bonds with them. Okay. Okay. And the rate at which they bought those, when things in the economy started to shift and change, right? The yield curve for those became inverted, right? And that's not the norm. So what ends up happening is, is if they buy these treasury notes and bonds at whatever amount of years they bought them, some short-term, some long-term, and they're at 1%, right? And then all of a sudden now, those same bonds that were paying 1% two years later or a year and a half later are paying 3 to 4%, and you needed to sell that bond, is somebody going to buy it at one when they could buy it at four? Right. They're stuck. Got it. Okay, so you're what I'm si- saying? so you're you're basically sitting there holding the bag until that correct, and that's exactly what happened. They're, Ill- they're illiquid. Yeah, yeah. So they and then that was that was caught wind of, and SVB needed to sell off some of that, and they took a major loss mm-hmm. on that portion of their portfolio, which so created that, a massive amount of risk. Is that what the they mean when they're saying that that situation happened and they needed the cash right away? So that correct. was that turned yeah, there into was a, like there was realized a, there was losses. A, yeah, there was a bank run. Exactly. Okay. There was a bank run. Yeah, so basically, exactly. and a bank run is clients started coming and saying, "Hey, I want my cash." It's a loss right? of confidence. I want to yeah. move. I want to move my money. And then when that happens, the bank has to now turn that into the funds that they need to make their clients whole. And those investments get caught up in the wind there, and now those investments are upside down, right? So okay. most banks, right, I would say a very large majority, especially community banks, they have a very strong strategic plan around risk and have a chief risk officer and a risk team that evaluates every single step that the bank takes to protect its clients and itself are not in that position, right? Right, Especially okay. at community banks that understand they need to go one step further to ensure that their clients and their organization are safe. Well, and I think I think ultimately the nature of their clientele isn't anywhere as dramatically as risky as Correct. the types of firms that this that they were <laughs> they were actually doing business with, right? So, yeah. And it's not even so much that the industry itself is risky, like the tech industry. It's not even necessarily that the industry itself may be risky, but it's the concentration of one yeah. industry you within your bank, right? So yeah. you look at a community bank, I have contractors, I have manufacturers, yeah, right. I have doctors, I have practices, I have you know wholesalers, retailers, yeah. I have restaurants, right? So you look at all that, that's a very diversified client base, right? Lots of different businesses that I know how to help, that I know how to review what their needs are short-term and long-term, and mm-hmm. I'm able to support them. That's the biggest part of it too. Having a relationship, a very tight-knit relationship with your community or local bank, it's almost like a privatized level of service. You know how many of my clients are thrilled because they have my phone number on speed dial. They can send me a text message or give me a phone call and say, hey, sir, this is what's going on today. Right. What? Yeah. How can we How can we make this work? How can we move this? This is what I'm needing today. That's not the norm. As you, as you segment out into larger and larger institutions, it becomes more of a blanket uniform approach to every client yeah. versus this very agile, flexible, tailored approach that a community bank is going to take to each one of their clients to ensure that their goals are getting met, both short-term and long-term, right? So that's that's the biggest difference that I would say is when you look at it, strategically, community banks are extremely invested in their community and mm-hmm. supporting the client base geographically that surrounds the city that they're involved with or that they're in. Well, right? that, that so, so then... Then how do you get away from the – so if you're in their situation where they're heavily relying on like tech and they're focused on an industry, mm-hmm. community banks are diversified across industries but usually geographically more in one place. So sure. what are some of the ways that – whatever you're able to get into on this, but like what are some of the ways that you can actually diversify and protect even though you have a – a geographical concentration. Well, we, have, I mean, we have, we just had the hurricane. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so. of course. I mean, we have clients in all 50 States, right? So it's not just to say that because we're a bank that's started in Wisconsin in the fifties and now we're 
you know, coming into Florida and expanding down here where there's amazing opportunity and there's a need for more community banks that have this hyper client focused central, no you doubt. know, privatized type service. It, it's not to say that you're just focused on that area because we'll support clients and their goals from anywhere, right? Sure. I mean, if they come to us and they tell a great story of what they're trying to accomplish and how their business currently operates, of course I'm gonna protect and serve a client that's elsewhere. Now, in the case of what your question was with a bank like SVB is how do they put themselves in position if they have all of their eggs in one basket, they're not very diversified, they're focused on one industry, and they don't necessarily have the means of what normal banks do to capitalize themselves, then ultimately you have to have a really strong strategy in place and really effective risk culture. Mm. And that's what was lacking, is that there wasn't a long term, there wasn't a very solid strategy, right? And there was there was a lack of a risk culture there to protect what the future was of the organization and most importantly, its clients, because that's what we always focus on, right? Yeah. Is how is the client protected? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point you made around community banks and and just demographically, like, 20 years ago, right? I mean, this bank didn't have 50 clients. No community bank in the country had clients in 50 states, right? Because the power of the internet changed banking, sure. right? And I think what's what's my question to you, Sergio, is like obviously banking has had, just like many other industries, you're seeing consolidation. Uh, you're seeing uh, just the nature of sometimes some some of the banking risk or, or um, value proposition change. Uh, what's the future of banking? So to me, honestly... I really see the long-term play here from community and smaller banks slowly but surely overtaking what the approach is from larger institutions. Interesting. Because, because we've kind of lost the art of, right, as a, as a society, we've lost the art of personal connection. Yeah. Everything's technology now, right? right? And technology is extremely important. In fact, the bank invests a ton into technology. We have an entire innovation vertical that focuses strictly on how technology can make things more convenient for clients. But what I will tell you is this, that convenience is never gonna take the place of human interaction right. at our institution. Right. That's always going to be the number one most important thing because that's what drives relationships and trust forward. And, you know, you look at, I'm somebody who comes from a large national bank, right? Um, and one of the biggest challenges was watching clients walk in somewhere, right? And, and a lot of times what they hedge is the convenience of being able to find one of these branches within every mile or every two miles. You walk in, but how convenient is it if you walk in and you can't be seen? Correct. Or you need to make an appointment for two days later. Or you walk in to see Sandra Oh, Sandra just moved to a different role or she she left the she left the institution. She left the organization two weeks ago. So there's comfort there in knowing your banker, knowing them long term, knowing that they understand your business or your personal relationship, what your goals are, and they're there to work as a partner to get you there. That right. has to be the value prop, is that every step of the way we're going to walk this financial journey with you versus giving you this blanket approach of here you are, you walk in, this is a menu of our services and products. Right. Choose what you'd like, please, right. and we'll see you in a couple of days or in a couple of weeks, right? right? It can't be but that way. AI is never getting around personal service and financial services. I don't care what they say. Like I know everyone's very you know, bullish on AI and what it can do, and, and I, I haven't really studied it yet, to be totally honest with you, but I, I think that that's a really, really well uh, point made that's it's like, you know, ultimately, this our game is about trust, right? I mean, it, and that's what people do in the financial services industry is is create trust and build trust, and they're experts. And so, maybe the day we ever get where it's like, you know, you walk into a bank and there's a robot there, you know, and you trust a robot. Come on, now. I mean, like, you know, I mean, that's it's got to be. A, I'm not going to be here when that happens. I know that, right? So, well, in some ways, it, I mean. It kind, it's kind of there in some ways. Like when you walk into certain banks, like you have the just the screen. Sure, you have like an automated yeah. teller or something like that, and that's okay because a it's lot like of it's times, more of an advanced it's, but it's, ATM. It's, but they're not giving you're you. You're transacting, but you're right? not you're not getting like advice. Exactly, correct. Yeah. It's not, it's yes. not consultative in nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So that's the that's what I would say is is the biggest difference. You know, Chris, when you look at yourself like a like a business owner, right? Think to yourself, you wake up in the morning and you know that you have a need 
at the bank for some reason. Maybe you need to send a wire. You know, maybe you just need to open up another account because you had another project come through or you just earned the trust of a new client so you're expanding, whatever it may be, okay? Sure. If that process takes three hours out of your day or potentially you had it planned for one day so you freed up your calendar, you had to go in and now change it to another day where you have to free up another four hours that you weren't expecting to free up, how does that impact you as a business owner? I just probably won't do it. Yeah. Or you'll try to figure out some like roundabout way of having to do it. Or mm -hmm. is the pain that I'm dealing with really as, is it really worth solving? Yeah. Like is, is it that bad? And it's, <laughs> and it's the time, right? Yeah. More, time, more lost opportunity cost. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> time, time, time has a monetary value for a business owner, right? Yeah. If I just took, if you're running your business by yourself, and I just, and you just lost four hours out of your day. That's four hours of productivity. Mm -hmm. What does that productivity translate to? And if it turns into eight hours, that's a full day's worth of productivity. Golf. What does that do? Yeah. yeah. Golf. What do you golf? Yeah. <laughs> what does that, what does that do to your, what does that do to your bottom line as a business owner? Right? So those are real questions mm -hmm. that need to be asked. Mm -hmm. What's the difference in comfort level when you can wake up and send a text message or a phone call directly to your banker or the president of the bank in this case and Ultimately, they're able to understand what you need because they know you and your business and say, yeah, give me a, give me a little bit and we'll have this handled right. by this time. And, and you can make a legitimate commitment. And I, I think it's also just gets back to, I just want to deal with a human being. Correct. Too. Yeah. I mean, I just, that, that's, I like the human interaction. I'm a people person. Like I want to look you in the eye and I want to make sure that I feel that you have credibility and you know what you're talking about. And it's like, I mean, this AI stuff is great, but like, and I'm, I'm sure there are going to be industries where it's going to re revolutionize it sure. in the next <clears throat> decade, right? Or like there's going to be, I saw today on my feed on Instagram, there's three, sh three uh, McDonald's shops in three different states around the country that are going totally employee, with not one employee in the whole restaurant. Wow, I didn't it's know that. It's all being done by AI. And, you know, I mean, that's clearly changes uh, a lot. Right. Yeah. In an economy. I mean, if restaurants aren't having people there to work. Right. I mean, you know, yeah. where are they going to what are they going to do for jobs? They're not skilled. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, so, you know, the times are changing for sure. But I, I think in our world, you know, we got 30, 40, 50 years at least. Yeah. So and um, you look at you look at the most even the most basic of things with AI. Right. Things have been implemented over time. Right. Little by little. Yeah. Right? You look at something as simple as calling into a store or a restaurant or a bank and what's what what responds to you when you call yeah like a an automated the, yeah a service, menu right? Right. Like an automated right. service you right. know for right. for reservations press one oh, yeah. or for yeah. for credit cards press one for business press two even something as simple as that you have no idea what the commitment to people can change their perception of how they're supposed to be treated because people have lost sight of how their relationships with financial institutions or with other businesses that they frequent are supposed to be managed, right? Correct. So like like yeah. our, our bank, we that's one thing that the owner, Ron Nicholas, who many years ago, decades when he started the bank, he said, until the day that we're gone, we will not change that. I will never not have a person answering my phone. phone. So every time you call a bank, a live person answers the phone. You do not get that. Hey, for business, press one. For personal, press two. For loans, press three. Like, and you have no idea the comfort that that gives someone knowing that when they call into the bank, that they're going to get a live person that picks up the phone every single time. Yeah, for I sure. Make, I make I make probably fifty to seventy five phone calls a, uh, a week, and That's, you know, you're now, low, now, you're now, low, now you're low I'm yeah, no, I'm, I'm you right. probably make no, 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 you had to step no, it up, dude. Yeah, I don't, right? <laughs> uh, but. You know, that I, w before you just said that, I just realized, like, you know, I there's probably 15 to 20% of people that call that you get to their voicemail. Nobody even answers the sure. phone. Like, sure. You know, I mean, it used to be 100% of people were answering their phone, and, you know, you got to get through the gatekeeper, right? Sure. So I'm, now I'm just like, push me to voicemail, bro. I can leave yeah, a voicemail. Yeah, just I got push, my, push me to voicemail. I got my pitch. is going to be right. better in voicemail. Yeah. It's just and, yeah. the, and the lost opportunity of that too, right? Because some people just get so frustrated with that on the phone after holding for 20 minutes uh, that they hang up. Right. And and that, right. that, that organization will never get the chance of knowing what that client needed help with today right. or tomorrow or the day after yeah. and what that relationship could turn into long-term. But you know who ends up being the benefactor of it? 
the organization that does pick up the phone, right. the organization that does make time to listen to that client, that does it efficiently and seamlessly. Well, and I, th- I think, so I, I think on a bigger scale things, it's like a twofold thing. I think almost like markets have clearly shown that it's okay for these companies to not pay attention to people and it doesn't seem to impact their bottom line in a way that impacts them or any way that they can like clearly see it. And it could also be a disconnect from when you get to that level, people don't understand how things work on the ground level. So they're not understanding the pain. They haven't, maybe haven't worked in yeah, the actual operation. They're probably been a huge. While. They're probably huge companies, right? I mean, like yeah. I, I always, uh, you know, airlines are ones that always stick out to me, right? Yeah, they're, they're just terrible, right, to try and deal with. And but like at, at a community bank where you're, you know, you're you're the guy who's working with the business owner is literally in a cell phone. Like it's a different organizational structure. Like I think when you For sure. when you have to get when you get so big that you have to have these kind of policies and processes in place. Yeah, I, I think it's 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 a necessary evil, right? That's yeah. what I, you sacrifice that, the personal touch. Well, and that's what I that's what I think it is. But I also think that that's it. Maybe it's natural. Like maybe this happens over and over again through time. We just can't perceive, you know, hundreds of years because <laughs> right. it's always like these things come up. These banks probably all the big banks right now probably started small bank, great service, all these things, that's what got them to the next level. And then they evolve right. and then they forget. And it always opens like a path for well, you have smaller to... companies to come in and yep. deliver that personal. That's how Correct. we did it with Flight Docs. The last sure. company I was at was, there was a Goliath in the industry. It had been around since the 60s. Right. It had all the relationships with the manufacturers, blah, blah, blah. We're the best, we're the best, but super old software. Nobody picked up the phone, nobody cared. And then pretty much all that we did was have really good technology and answer the phone in two rings. Like we weren't doing like, yeah, it wasn't earth shattering stuff. It's not rocket science. And and the company grew 30% year over year for like 10 years. And it it will, you know, natch organically that'll happen because a a company too has to decide how it's going to scale. Right. Always. You have to decide how you're going to scale. So Chris, if today I have 10 people answering the phone, but we're doing such a great job at this that, you know, we have a thousand clients and now we've just brought in, I'm just using round numbers here. Now we've grown from a thousand to two, right? And, and I still have those same 10 people. Guess what? Their volume can get out of hand. Now the commitment that we made of, we're going to answer the phone every time at two rings, it's going to be, it's going to become more difficult, right? So as an organization, you decide, how are you going to scale? Are you going to turn that 10 into 20 sure. and continue the same brand promise that you made, or are you going to instead just bring on five? Mm-hmm. But your your client base has doubled, so now you're starting to sacrifice some of those commitments you made early on to become who you were, in the in the sense of being able to try to take the greatest advantage from a monetary perspective mm-hmm. for the organization. And that's where that's where I feel like community banks really get it different because they're they're not going to sacrifice that gain for themselves and make lives more difficult for their client base, sure. for their future prospects, future clients, or anyone else who wants to get involved in something really special. Sure. Very cool. Okay. Well, guys, as we uh, wrap this thing up, what do you guys want to leave people with? Anything? You go first. I would man. say for okay. me, for me, always try to look at things from a lens that is not the norm okay. or that what's become societally acceptable, Right. For me, as somebody who's become, that's been on both sides of the token from the finance world at a large institution and at a more private boutique style bank service um, of Incredible Bank, I would say that there are massive advantages to knowing your banker directly and knowing that the people that are within the building and outside of the building are people that you can trust and communicate with immediately. And they'll have a large long-term benefit to you financially, both on the personal side and especially on the small business side to help you grow because you have some extremely dynamic, talented individuals who have a real desire to see you come, your your goals come to fruition. So that's a that's a big part of it for me. Okay. I think it's for me, it's, um, I'd like to play more golf down here. Uh, so if anyone's listening and invite me to their country club. <laughs> okay. Good and, last uh, tidbit. Good last tidbit. And actually now that we're getting out of season, 
Ra- oh, you, you, you might not have to pay oh, this is what two need, or three hundred. We need to talk about this for like three minutes. So I've heard about <laughs> I've heard about this thing called the summer pass. Okay. Like, do you guys know what it's about? No. No, so, like, you can apparently get. Um, I think you can buy like a summer pass, and it's like it has where you can go on a, a lot of different courses because they have reciprocal oh, things yeah, yeah. and stuff. Do you, you know anything about this? No, but I I I have somebody here. I'll I'll ask right okay. after we're done with this. There's okay. somebody here that would n- know, that? know the answer for yeah. sure. So. Yep. I'll, I'll get you that answer okay. after this. And Fine. if we can't get the answer today, we'll put this out there and we'll see we'll see that's, if anybody right. comes back. And then we'll, we'll play some golf via we go. LinkedIn. Yeah. I like it. Okay. LinkedIn golf. Yeah. <laughs> LinkedIn, yeah. LinkedIn golf. What uh where can people find you, Sergio? Anywhere. You got LinkedIn. You have my personal cell phone is on my business card. So cool. I'll feel free to give that out to anybody who needs it or yourself, even Chris. All right. Um, but I get messages on LinkedIn all the time. People call me, shoot me text messages, find me on social media, whatever it is. You know, I'm I'm open to help anyone all the time, anywhere. So, cool. and I really have tried to help people scale to the best of their ability. And they've seen some, some massive returns on that. So nice. I'm glad to do it. That's how, that's how we met yeah. Yeah. Your, your, your podcast, your first one. Yeah. That's yep. how me and Sergio met. So, yeah. uh, good stuff. So yeah, just that LinkedIn is, is by far the best way to get me. So cool. I'll, and I'll throw you guys links in the show notes. That way awesome. people can just click it and find you. Thanks Great. brother. Sweet. Thank you Thanks. guys for doing this. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, Chris. Good Appreciate stuff. it. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely.